Uh, thank you. So um, uh, it's brilliant coming um, after Moshe and Matthew and Wynne, um, simply because I think they are the future scenario of this topic, um, and uh, which is largely around um, citizen science, which I'll explain a bit further. Um, it's a joint uh, authored uh, presentation by myself and colleague Jonathan Bowen. And uh, you may have noticed I'm also from Melbourne and coming from um, Australia and speaking from there at this time. So uh, it's with great uh, uh, pleasure as well that I acknowledge the traditional owners on the land on which I work and pay my respects to the elders past and present. And Bunjil Place is a beautiful occasion for just um, understanding the spiritual connections with um, Aboriginal um, land and traditions as well. So this topic um, takes us right to um, Alan Turing and artificial intelligence has been mentioned a few times by speakers today. And the um, anniversary of Turing's um, birth, which um, uh, was tied into a citizen science um, project at uh, the Manchester Museum of Science and Industry. And uh, looking at this project, it struck me that how multifaceted Turing was and how he wasn't just a you know, mathematician and philosopher and computer scientist, but he was actually also a citizen scientist. He had a great deal of interest in sunflowers and what we might call um, Fibonacci numbers. Um, and uh, this citizen science project actually continued a project that Turing never finished. So it was quite um, a, a interesting tribute to the man. Now Fibonacci is named after a medieval mathematician who wrote a book on the abacus in the 1200s. So we're going back way back in time and looking at uh, mathematical sequences in nature particularly spirals, for instance, in pine cones and in sunflower heads. And so this project that uh, brought together the public and fired up the imagination about Fibonacci numbers and these amazing sequences, what we might call morphogenesis as well, which is around mathematics in nature. And, so, and, and thus this topic um, around museums and public participation and research also arose uh, in, in this talk through this project that started with looking at Alan Turing and an unfinished uh, project which brought together the public. So public participation in research. Well, going back to an Aboriginal um, agenda again in terms of where citizen science sits, indigenous knowledge has gone um, way back in centuries in terms of scientific observation and, narr and narrative around scientific phenomena. And here we can see the stars renamed in terms of Aboriginal names, and we are actually the ones who've renamed them. But these red giant stars, for instance, bear the names of uh, animals and other phenomena that were um, familiar to um, um, Aboriginal cultures in Australia. So I like the uh, dingo puppies, for instance. Um, so the, uh, sorry, um, I'm going instead forward and back. Citizen science itself as a term and as a movement has actually um, much more recent um, uh, use in terms of how we look at it perhaps from a Western perspective, um, that citizen science um, was the purview of gentlemen and gentlewomen, um, normally uh, driven by curiosity and observation uh, in a time when scientific literacy or so-called scientific literacy wasn't very high. And then leading into a period where citizen science suddenly diminished again, when we had more formalization, interestingly, of um, of the scientific process. And then as we come into the present day, we can see an opening up of science and open knowledge, which um, 
brings us to a period of quite a large flourishing of, of citizen science and public participation in research associated with museums and the cultural sector. So um, for instance, an, an example of a gentleman, a uh, citizen scientist is um, James Murray, uh, who is a lexicographer um, based in Oxford, who was the father in a sense of the o Oxford English Dictionary. And uh, he brought in the public through calls of participation to submit uh, words and, and phrases and quotes, which became part of the Oxford English Dictionary as we, as we know it today. Citizen science as a definition is actually uh, quite recent. Um, we saw citizen science as term coming into the uh, literature in the uh, mid 1990s. And the Oxford English Dictionary only brought it into its dictionary in 2014. But largely it's around scientific work undertaken by members of the general public, often under the direction of professional scientists. But we'll also see that there's quite a, an empowered public that have also designed their own uh, research. And, uh, and they are coming in at different levels of participation. Now the enablers have been largely around open science, open data, open source, open knowledge, and societal trends such as increased education, increased leisure, uh, peer, pre peer, pre -production, peer production systems, for instance, and also underpinned by technological trends such as uh, more DIY technologies, the web, high performance computing, et cetera. So um, public participation in research um, is largely a confluence um, across um, the rise of online communities, scientific collaboration, uh, approaches like crowdsourcing and volunteer monitoring, for instance. And uh, there's several different ways in which we can look at citizen science and also in terms of the names in which it can be called. And it's largely around aspects of the collective, but also the individual and the ways in which we process information or we might compute information and the ways of which we might bring together uh, a public. So there are quite a number of um, uh, citizen science projects and uh, platforms which you might already know. And they have large numbers of uh, volunteers around the world, such as iNaturalist, which, um, which you can submit uh, uh, observations from the natural environment, eBird, which is specific to, to types of birds, and Zooniverse, which has a platform that supports many different types of projects. But there's also public volunteer compu com computing, such as in the late 1990s, the, uh, the project called SETI at Home, or the Search for Extraterrestrial Intelligence, which is basically a distributed computing uh, platform in which many, many members of the public have been part of it. And it's only just um, on pause now after 20 years of being in existence. eBird, for instance, is a very powerful platform um, that was established by Cornell uh, in 2002. And it, it uh, gets submissions of millions of observations per, per, per month, not just uh, per year. And Galaxy Zoo, which many of you may already uh, tried as well, very famous for a number of uh, discoveries that came out of Galaxy Zoo. And it's really about identifying different types of galaxy shapes. Um, and um, um, over a million volunteers are part of this project. So types of participation really depend on the relationship between the public and the researcher, how, how much a project is designed by the scientist and the role of the public in contributing data, or more collaboratively might be even part of the research process in terms of uh, project design or analysis of data, and then co-created projects, which has a, uh, a more um, substantial role for, for a public participant or a citizen scientist. Um, Data is very, very key to citizen science. Um, and the different types of participation really relate to how data might be collected or, or used or analyzed as a result of uh, levels of participation. So platforms that uh, are, uh, you, are, are known for citizen science uh, for you to explore is Zooniverse and Z SciStarter, which has over 2000 projects listed 
and also from where I am in Australia, the Citizen, Australian Citizen Science Association Project Finder. There are many tools that reflect the contemporary ways in which we collect data. So everything from citizen sensing kits, uh, air kits and the FIDO sensor kit by the Citizen Sense Group, or Spotteron, which provides a, um, a mobile apps and uh, supports data collection and, uh, and submission to different platforms, and EpiCollect, another tool which citizens uh, who are interested in setting up projects can, can set up. And then there's the World Community Grid um, um, hosted by IBM, which is really Boink, which is the platform that SETI runs on. And then citizen science associations, much like the definition of citizen science are relatively new, but they um, show a growing formalization of citizen science um, practice. And uh, this includes the European Citizen Science Association uh, in um, uh, Europe, uh, the Citizen Science Association in the US and also in Australia. Now citizen science and cultural heritage Natural history museums have been particularly associated with citizen science training and people in the field, as well as online platforms. And there's quite a long association with them. Um, for instance, the Natural History Museum in London, but also the uh, Museum für Naturkunde in Berlin. Crowdsourcing is a um, 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 common approach to citizen science. And Mia Ridge's book on, on crowdsourcing cultural heritage is a very good foundation in the types of approaches that citizen science crowdsourcing can, can uh, achieve and what kind of tasks, including um, um, Stuart Dunn's and Mark Hedge's book on academic crowdsourcing. And I think Stuart's a keynote uh, today. So what are the types of uh, tasks that might be uh, supported? Well, there's transcription and uh, as being a key one for a lot of humanities-based and social science-based projects, such as Old Weather, which um, is um, uh, quite an, an, an old project as well, um, looking at ship's logs um, supported by the UK Met Office. And then there might be other projects as this one on uh, Notes from Nature, which is the California Academy of Sciences, looking at strict transcription of old catalog cards, for instance. A lot of this cannot be automated due to handwritten records. So we are also um, very much um, reliant on citizens to achieve this. And volunteer geographic information, such as the British Library's georeferencer, which allows you to look at the ways old maps can be um, laid all across uh, new maps and how these new geographies um, uh, can be uh, understood. Participatory sensing, for instance, a project by the Museum of London, which um, supported citizens going around the Barbican site and um, looking at air quality. And they will see a lot of citizens activated by uh, environmental health and air quality sensing, for instance, around Heathrow and other airports around the world. Creating content is a very important one where citizens can contribute. And we've seen museums support this uh, through many programs. COVID-19 has been a particular catalyst for contribution of content. And here we see um, particularly uh, uh, a range of, of, of ways in which content has been created and including 3D printing of uh, uh, personal protection equipment, uh, which Museum of Science and Industry supported but also the Australian National Australian Museum in, in Australia um, looking at COVID stories. Uh, data analysis, for instance, the Rijksmuseum um, collection of artworks where the public are invited to, to identify flora and fauna in, um, in, in artworks. And also problem solving. Uh, Recre is a, is a um, an interesting project that came out of the destruction of Mosul's um, ancient cultural heritage and photographs being reconstructed into 3D um, uh, images and uh, uh, virtual artifacts representing a lot of these monuments that have been destroyed. And now it's being used also to support the reconstruction of, of cultural artifacts destroyed by natural disasters, for instance, as well as from war and human interference. Um, 
and very much like the, the, the speakers earlier about the um, use of machine learning and artificial intelligence, they're very complicated algorithms that are often part of the platforms of citizen science, such as LeafSnap, which where anyone can take a picture of a plant and then have it identified through LeafSnap. LeafSnap. Uh, and serious games such as iWire, which is a, um, a way in which the public can look at problem solving through um, connecting neurons and mapping the brain. So to conclude, um, public participation uh, in museums have been around for a long time, but the aspects of citizen science as both a, a practice as well as a, um, a, a movement that's being um, very much flourishing in the last two decades, brings up also questions of ethics and inclusion. Um, and what is a citizen scientist and who can be a citizen scientist? And um, this particular um, paper is a very good one to think about how we can term ourselves, what it means to uh, think about uh, the human as a sensor, uh, what it means to um, take on board local traditional knowledge as well as, you know, am I a citizen? Does, um, does that also exclude me if I am not, for instance, Australian? As you can tell from my accent, I am not Australian. I'm actually Canadian. But does that mean I can participate or not participate in an Australian citizen science project, for instance? So going back to participation, and this is my last slide, is thinking about Nina Stimon's um, uh, seminal book on the participatory museum and how we can look at that as well in terms of bringing on citizen science and new ways of participating in research that is um, supported by cultural organizations and what that might mean. Thank you very much. Okay, thank you very much, Anne. Um, so do we have, we have time for maybe one or two short questions, if anyone has anything they'd like to post in the chat? Okay, so I, I don't, I'm not immediately seeing any questions. So I think as, as um, yeah, we have slightly over time, we'll, oh, no, we have got one. So yeah. So Milton asks, how might citizen science interact with or even mitigate the current climate of anti-science, denialism, post-truth and Dunning-Krugery? Well, that's a very good question. And uh, it really is around the public as part of a uh, collective uh, intelligence sort of uh, community. Um, and, uh, you know, the questions of what is truth and what is, uh, you know, uh, an authoritative source is a really good question. Uh, you really do need larger collaborations to be able to um, think about these questions. And, uh, and a lot of the citizen science, which I showed as examples, were partnered with what we might call trusted uh, institutions. Uh, such as the British Library, the uh, you know larger natural history uh, museums, but also um, uh, trusted community uh, organizations as well. And uh, so I think that that's a really good question. Um, and it's a bigger question than perhaps what can be solved uh, through a citizen science approach. But I think you, we're also looking at uh, civic uh, uh, platforms as well, and uh, looking at ways in which, um, as I say, a collective approach can be um, brought together. Uh, and I wonder if Jonathan might also have a, have a, a question to, uh, or answer to um, respond to that one too. Would you like to come in there, Jonathan? Okay, well, uh, <laughs> no. Nothing specific, but I, I guess things are getting better with the US elections and hopefully uh, citizen science will improve uh, for the future. Uh, things are slightly improving here as well with our uh, political situation. So uh, uh, I'm getting more optimistic for the future at the moment. Mm. Okay, great. Well, I think perhaps we'll, we'll leave it there, um, but thank you very much. Um, thank you.
yeah that concludes this session